you're getting ready to hear a message from one of our Sunday experiences at Hope Church. But before you do that, click the subscribe button. That way, you can stay up to date with all of our content and every video that we drop each week. Enjoy the message. Go to the book of Jonah. Oh Lord, Jonah. We're in a series right now called In the Same Boat. Um, I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and listen to last week's message, Same Boat, Different Storm, and, and check that out. Um, I think it'll bless you. But today we're going to a different boat, and it's the boat Jonah's on. So we're going to see what this has to show us today. Let's look at chapter one, and I'm going to kind of, I'm going to read certain chunks from each chapter uh, and paraphrase, and uh, just so, just keep, a, keep, keep up with me. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going down to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Right? But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, there's that word tempest again, on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So last week, Jesus was sleeping. This week, Jonah's sleeping. So the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And so paraphrasing, they cast lots to see who was the cause of this storm. Go to verse 10, and it says, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to Jonah, why have you done this? Because it says, for the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. He told them this is why the storm is happening. And he said, this is, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? I love that verse. It just, it's really real. What are we going to do to you so we can make this sea calm for us? And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it, as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. That is mind-boggling crazy. All right, go to chapter 2 and jump to verse 10. I just want to show you a few things, and I'm going to let you sit down. Chapter 2, verse 10, Jonah's been in the belly of the fish, right? He's been in there for three days and three nights, and he prays in the belly of the fish, <laughs> cries out to God, and we get to verse 10 after he gets through praying, and it says in verse 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Sometimes you just got to like marinate on what you're reading. Like, what? He vomited Jonah up? Like, how close was he? I got questions. Like, how close was he to shore? Like, was it like a cannon? Did it shoot him out? Was it a projectile? Or was it just like a he fell out kind of deal? I know I'm grossing some of y'all out right now. I'll move on. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message I tell you. So Jonah arose, I bet he did, and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Somebody say the first day. And he cried out, saying, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And word came to the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth as well. Go to chapter 4. I'm almost done, I promise, okay? Here we go. Verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 1. After Jonah preaches to Nineveh and leaves the city, 
He sees God is turning his anger from this city. And God's not going to punish the city with destruction. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jo it displeased Jonah. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. In other words, he said, I knew this was going to happen. That's what he's saying. And so he wants the Lord to take his life. That's what he does. So the Bible says in verse 5, he goes out of the city, he builds a shelter to sit and watch what happens to the city. He still wants the city to be destroyed. He's, he w goes out of the city and builds a little shelter, a little hut, and watches to see if God destroys it. But watch what God does. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head. So Jonah was grateful for the plant. Verse 7, But as the morning God, God dawned, God prepared a worm. And the worm ate the plant, and it killed the plant. And when the plant died, verse 8, God prepared a vehement east wind that blew on Jonah so badly the heat caused his head to be faint. And he started to be faint because of the, the wind God sent. God said to Jonah, or then Jonah said, is it better for me to die than to live? And he wished death on himself. And God said, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He said, it is right for me to be angry. That's what Jonah said back to God. The Lord said, you've had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock, which means they, can't, they don't have any moral compass. And I want you to know that's where Jonah's story ends, right there. So I want to pick up where his story ends. I want to preach a message called Fleeing Frustration. Fleeing Frustration. Lord, open our ears and our hearts. Right now, we're ready to hear what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Tell your neighbor it's time to flee from frustration. I think it's tragic that the end of Jonah's story ends the way that it does. I think we all can agree with that. If you really look at how Jonah's story ends, it ends with Jonah extremely frustrated with what has taken place. He's frustrated. And we don't know what happens of Jonah after this. We, we have no clue of how he processes through the frustration of, of what has taken place. We, have no, we don't know. And he, the story ends with Jonah frustrated. It, it ends with Jonah upset. It ends with Jonah mad. It ends with Jonah angry about what has happened and what has not happened. Frustrated. Frustrated. And, 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 and frustration, and the word frustrated uh, literally means feeling discouragement, anger, and annoyance because of unresolved problems or unfulfilled goals, desires, or needs. Let me say it again. Frustrated means feeling discouragement, anger, and annoyance because of unresolved problems. I wonder if some people, I got some unresolved problems in here. Unfulfilled goals. Unfulfilled desires or unfulfilled needs. That is the definition of being frustrated. Unfulfilled. Unmet. Unresolved. Things that are just kind of left hanging and not completed. Not completed, but I like to look at the antonyms of words as well. Not just the synonyms for all my English majors. I like the opposite of frustrated because I think that's where the Lord wants us to step into today and flee frustration because, because some, there's too many people living in frustration. There's too many people making decisions out of frustration. You're literally making life decisions out of frustration. You're making decisions out of things that have frustrated you. And, and rather, than, rather than flee frustration, you just rather make a decision out of frustration and deal with whatever the results may be. The opposite of frustrated is encouraged. It's fulfilled. It's inspired. It's uplifted. How many know that's your portion from God? That you don't have to live in frustration day after day after day. That there is a greater portion. That there is the joy of the Lord. 
that there is hope, that there is, there is goodness and mercy and, and there's a grace and all these things that God provides because He is good. But too many times we live out of frustration. We wake up, wake up on Monday morning frustrated. Go to bed Monday night frustrated. Wake up Tuesday morning frustrated. Wait, go to bed Tuesday night frustrated. And the cycle continues and it seems there may be some good days that you wake up and you feel a little bit better, but you're not totally out of frustration because that thing is just still hanging there. <laughs> and then there's bad days where you are totally consumed and immersed in the unmet, unrealized, unfulfilled portion of your life. And too many of us have been living in frustration for too long, and today it's time to come out of it. Now, I'm not being unrealistic. I know reality of life, things are going to frustrate you. I totally get it. We're all going to deal with frustration, but, but frustration is not a zip code. Frustration is, is not a house you go in and dwell in. It's, it's a place you can pass by. You don't have to stay in frustration. You don't have to stay in the anger. You don't have to stay in the unforgiveness and the resentment and stay in that place of unmet, unfulfilled desire, or unmet goal. Some of you, you, your goals have not been reached yet, and you're frustrated with you. You're not frustrated with other people. You might not be frustrated with certain situations. You're just frustrated with you. And you wake up every day staring your biggest frustration in the mirror. And you won't forgive yourself. You won't treat yourself good. You talk to yourself like garbage. You tell yourself you're never going to make it. How, how would somebody receive that if you were saying those same words to them? And then why are you saying them to yourself? Frustrated. Marinating. Contemplating. Just constantly. It's in your head. Just constantly playing it over. Playing the scenario over. Playing the conversation over. Going through it over and over again. And all that seems to do is produce more and more frustration. And out of that place you are living out of. You are talking out of it. You are making decisions out of it. You are going into relationships out of frustration. Frustrated. But today we're fleeing frustration. We're fleeing frustration. Say it with me. Say, I'm fleeing frustration today. Not tomorrow. Today. You got to make a decision every single day of your life, every single moment to say, I refuse to live in frustration. I'm going to process the frustration. I can understand that this thing, this situation, this person, hello, frustrates me. I felt something when I said person. That, that got, kind of got real. And you got a feeling of discouragement, anger, annoyance because of unresolved problems, unresolved goals, unfulfilled desires or needs. And Jonah's story ends that way. His story ends with him questioning God. But I want to encourage you, just because his story ended that way doesn't mean yours has to. Just because Jonah's story. What if, what if God set up Holy Scripture? See, I think, what if God set up Holy Scripture for Jonah's story to end with frustration so we could pick up and close the deal and say, I refuse to let this story end with frustration. I refuse to let this relationship and what happened keep me in constant anxiety and frustration and resentment. I refuse to live there. I refuse to live there. But we got to find out how did we get here. All the stuff I read to you just a minute ago is what, what led up to the moment of Jonah's frustration. The thing you need to see that I want to kind of walk down, if we just walk down scripture real quick, is God calls Jonah to go to preach to Nineveh. He says, go and preach and cry out, actually, against the wickedness of this city, Nineveh. And, of course, we know Jonah went the other way. He went and got on a boat. He went and got on a boat and started to take a trip in the opposite direction. A lot of people, we're in that same boat today of frustration. And all of us are in, are in that same place, but we're dealing with different sources of frustration. 
We're dealing with different winds of frustration, different waves of frustration, but we're in the same boat. And so the Bible says he went down to Tarshish and he paid the fare. He, it always costs you to go in the opposite direction of where God is calling you. He paid the fare. And the Bible says in verse 4, watch this, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. The Lord did. The Lord, not the devil. The Lord sent a wind that caused a storm. So while you're busy rebuking the devil, God's like, I'm the one that sent that. Yes, there are storms. We talked about it last week. There are storms, I believe, that have demonic influence attached to them. But can I tell you, God can send a storm too? And he is okay in sending storms for the very wind and waves have to obey him. And so it says, not the devil sent out a great wind, but the Lord sent out a storm. Can I tell you that God will send a storm just to come get you? Amen. He will use whatever vehicle necessary to get you back in alignment into your purpose. And so while we are busy rebuking the devil and, uh, and attacking hell with a water pistol, and we are upset at the devil, the Lord is like, I sent the storm because you are out of alignment. I'm trying to get you back onto the path that I need you to be on to go into the direction I need you to go in. So I'm going to allow this storm to come. Have we ever taken time to consider maybe the storm we are currently in may be from God? We don't like to hear that though. That's a tough pill to swallow. That the Lord would allow a storm. That he would allow a storm, but he will use whatever vehicle he finds necessary to get his people to where they need to go. It doesn't feel good at the time. It doesn't sound good at the time. It's a little troubling and unsettling. But he will use whatever he wants to to get you where he needs to. And it says he sent the wind on the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it says in verse 5, they began when the storm showed up, the storm showed up that they were throwing cargo over the boat. All these other sailors that are on the boat with Jonah, and here they are throwing over what's valuable to them over the boat because of someone else's irresponsibility. Can I park here for a moment? Have you ever been on the receiving end of someone being careless with their calling? Hmm. Have you ever been in a place where, where you were the recipient of someone else being irresponsible with their walk? And you lost stuff. And things broke up in your life because someone else could not recognize the weight of calling on their life. And so you threw some stuff overboard. You ended some relationships. You stopped some stuff there. You shut doors. All the while, the one that caused it is down in the boat sleeping. Have you ever been in that place where you were the recipient of someone else's irresponsibility? and had to deal with the repercussions and you now got to live with the trauma yeah yeah the trauma of what you threw overboard you got to reconcile in your own heart and mind man I can't get that back I threw it off yeah it gets real because sometimes we don't take time to consider the trauma and the emotional trauma the, 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 the mental places that we find ourselves in because we threw something overboard we didn't have to and it takes it takes some reconciling in our own self that that and you have to forgive yourself for what you threw over maybe I shouldn't have done that Maybe I shouldn't have did that. Maybe, I, maybe I, I should have did it this way. Have you ever looked back on your life and reflected on how wrong you were? I know there's not a lot of people these days want to take ownership for responsibility, but it is refreshing when you can look back and say, I was completely wrong. I was completely wrong in that moment. I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have had this. I should have made this, this decision. And you can look back and say, I was wrong there. You know what that tells me? You've actually grown. Because if the you you are now can look back at the you you were then and disagree, you have grown. You should disagree with the older version of yourself. You should be able to disagree with things you've done. You're not always right. And sometimes, church, you throw stuff overboard you shouldn't. 
Sometimes we let things come out of our mouth that we shouldn't. But pressure always causes what's in us to come out of us. Pressure always causes things to come out of us that are resting in our heart. And when the moment intensifies and when the season pressurizes and pressure gets turned up, you find out what's really in you. And if we are careful, we will be, be people who will acknowledge, I didn't know that was in me. Lord, since this storm revealed it, can you help me recover what I lost? Can you help me recover what I threw over that I might not be able to get back? It might not be perfect. It's what they say about a, a broken relationship. It's like a broken plate. You can put it back together, but it won't be the same sometimes. But at least bring some reconciliation to it. And they threw stuff overboard. In other words, they experienced collateral damage because of someone else's carelessness with their calling. They were the collateral damage of someone else's running from God. That's why you got to be careful who gets in your boat with you. I'm, I'm sorry to be cliche, but you gotta get, you got to be careful who gets into the boat with you and, and, and who, who you start to, to row in the boat with. You, got, you have to understand that sometimes storms come into your life not because you caused it, but because of who is with you. Somebody say we're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. They threw cargo. Uh, other people on the boat are experiencing pain because of someone else's action someone else's responsibility this is what trips me out Jonah is asleep right and he's not asleep like Jesus was asleep last week right like Jesus was asleep because he was the picture of peace remember that he, he, he it was it was powerful remember because we said he actually needed sleep and then the fact that he could sleep like we know we need God but the fact we can we trust God like remember that okay but this time, Jonah is not sleeping because he is the epitome of peace. Jonah is sleeping as a result of being worn out from running. Because there's a certain type of exhaustion that hits your life when you don't surrender fully to God. When you don't surrender fully to God, and you can come on Sunday and surrender from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., and you can surrender in that two-hour time block, but it's when Monday comes, and, and it's when Tuesday comes, and, and it's when Wednesday shows up, and, and it's Thursday, and you're ready for the weekend to get here again. Are you still surrendered? Because there's a certain type of exhaustion that hits your life when you are not fully surrendered to the Lord God Almighty. And he is exhausted and he's worn out because when you, use, when you do your work absent from your gift, you end up exhausted. Did you hear me? When you do work absent from your gift, you end up exhausted. Jonah evidently has a gift to speak. He evidently has a call on God, a call of God on his life to go and preach. Pam, because God chooses him to go speak to a whole city of 120,000 people. Evidently, the man can speak every now and then. But he's worn out in the bottom of the boat because he's working overtime to flee from what God's calling him. And when you do work without your gift, you end up exhausted. He's in the bottom of the boat asleep, and here comes the captain waking him up. I thought about calling this message, I'm the captain now. But I didn't. I didn't do it. Some of you don't get that reference. Whatever. Verse 12. It says, Jonah said, they find out Jonah is the reason this whole storm is happening. I'm just trying to point some, a few observations out. And, and hopefully you can apply it. The storm is because of Jonah. They've thrown stuff overboard. They've thrown over their stuff. They've lost their valuables. And here comes the captain waking Jonah up. They figure out it's Jonah who is the problem. And Jonah's like, it's me. I'm the reason. I'm the problem. This storm has shown up. And he says in verse 12, pick me up and throw me overboard. And the sea will be calm for you. This messes with me a little bit. Because I got one question. Jonah? And it's high pitched. Why can't you just jump up on the ledge and jump off yourself? You use those legs to run here. 
why don't you use them same legs to spring on off the side of the boat and we can call this thing a wrap. Why, why do we got to pick you up and throw you over? Why do we got to take more responsibility for you now? Why can't you just jump over the side? And sometimes you have to reconcile with the fact there's some people who will never take responsibility for what truly has happened. Can I, I, won't, I, 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 gotta, I gotta be real vulnerable with you right now. And some of you won't like this because you think, I know you think I'm some kind of angel, but guess what? I'm the villain in someone else's story. I'm the bad guy. And guess what? You are too. <laughs> but we don't like that though. We, 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 we don't want to get on the ledge ourselves and jump off for what we're responsible for. So pick me up and throw me over. I need y'all to do it. But here's the hope in it. Here's the revelation. Here's what God showed me. You need people in a storm that love you enough to pick you up and help you get back in the direction you should be going in. See, it looked like they were just throwing Jonah off into the ocean. They looked like they were just throwing him out there to die, but little did they realize they were picking him up and tossing him and moving him back into the direction he needed to be going in. See, you need people in a storm who know how to push you, <laughs> who know how to push you off in the right direction, who know how to push you in back into your purpose, who will push you out of discouragement and back into your calling, push you out of that woe is me attitude and that pity party you have been living in for the last year and you need people on your boat in a storm that will come along inside, inside you and say, all right, you've been on this boat long enough. I'm going to push you now. I'm going to push you. You need to sit by people in church who will push you to, to, to praise God, who will push you to serve. Tell the person next to you, push them real quick and say, you sit by me long enough, you might wind up serving and fulfilling purpose. If you sit by me long enough, you might realize what your dream really is. You sit by me long enough, you might end up starting something that God had already ordained for you. You sit by me long enough, we might have a pollen Silas moment and start breaking some stuff down. If you sit by me long enough, I'm going to push you to do something wild. I'm going to push you to do something crazy. I ain't never jumped off the side of a boat before well, at least in the middle of a storm. There was that one time at Lake Tobosofsky but that's a whole other story. But, but, but I ain't never jumped off a boat in a storm, but, but the fact that somebody can come and push me into my purpose, it looked like a raging sea. It looked like a storm that they were pushing him off into. But really, what they were pushing him into is his next destination. They were pushing him into his next stop on the journey back. See, some of you are on the journey back into your calling. You're on the journey back from addiction. You're on the journey back from breakup and loss and failure. And you need some people you can trust on your boat that'll be faithful enough to push you when you don't want to be pushed, that'll call you when you don't feel like talking, that'll pray for you when you don't even know how to pray for yourself. I wonder if there's anybody in the room who are some pushers. High five three people say, I'm a pusher. <laughs> I'm a pusher. I'm gonna push you to be great. I'm gonna push you to keep going. I'm going to push you to keep showing up. And if you don't show up, I'm going to come get you in my boat, and I'm going to push you even further. You need people in a storm who know how to push you into your next destination and push you into the right direction. Somebody say, I'm going to push. Hallelujah. You need some pushers. It might have looked like they were throwing him into water to die, but they were pushing him into his next spot that God needed him. Watch this. Somebody say, I'm in the same boat. Watch this, watch this. So he said, pick me up and throw me. Watch this. Verse 13. 
It says, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. They didn't want to do it. Right? That wasn't their first choice. They're like, no, nah, let's, let's try to figure this out. And it says they rode hard to try to get back to. You catch that? They rode to go back. Their destination is where? Tarshish. Thank you, brother. Tarshish. But now, because of who's on their boat, they're thinking about turning back. Are you catching the revelation? Because of who decided to join them, they're now considering something they never would have considered before had they not been on the boat with Jonah. Now they're thinking about quitting. Now they're, now they're exhausting themselves trying to row, and the Bible says it was pointless because the storm continued to grow. And they're rowing, in, and this is where I see some people today. This is where I see some people. You're rowing in a storm that someone else was responsible for. You're rowing in a storm. They, they, did, they, they didn't want to do it. Just like some of us, we don't want to do what needs to be done. We don't want to have the conversation that needs to be had. You know how many people I've met that says, I don't want to cause no problem. I don't want to be, you know, I don't, I don't like being in drama. I don't either, but I still got to be a leader. And you know what? Leaders got to have some hard conversations every now and then. Leaders got to got to pony up, if you will, and sit down and look people in the eyeball and talk and not text. Tell me. Look at me. Responsibility. I don't I don't want to row harder and exhaust myself trying to go back to where I don't want to go back to. You feeling me? I want to make sure we're in the same boat right now. And it says, they rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. They'd re rather return and go back than do what should be done. This is the next part. Again, this whole story just messes with me. It really does. Because the next part is the craziest verse I've probably ever read. One of the craziest verses. In chapter 1, verse 17. Can we just look at that together one more time? Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Like, <laughs> really? You prepared a fish to swallow Jonah. You know what that tells me? Because the Lord is doing all of this just to get Jonah back to where he needs to be. He's going through all this trouble. Who sent the storm? Who sent the fish? Some of us, we were thrown out in that water like Jonah. 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 Transparent moment. I still hear Jaws music when I swim in the pool. Do you do, you do that? Do you go to the deep end? You just hear, Jonah, Jonah. I'm like, oh, God. There's a shark in the eight-foot pool. No, there's not. Threw in the water. And, and God prepared a fish. Now, just, just walk this down for a minute. A fish. A great fish. Some would probably say this is a trophy winning fish. <coughs> Big enough to swallow a man whole and still be alive. It's in the fairy tale, y'all.
This fish, God preserved from its very creation to be the vehicle at this very moment when the sailors would throw Jonah overboard to pick him up. From the creation of this fish, it never got caught by a fisherman. It never got killed by something. It never got ate by another animal, another fish in the sea, another beast. No, this fish was preserved from the time of its birth to this point in history to be at the exact spot where Jonah would be thrown overboard. Don't tell me that God doesn't have a plan for your life. Because some of you are not Jonah, you're the fish. <laughs> And you're the one God is bringing by at the exact time, at the exact moment, to pick up a brother or sister who is missing the target, who's running from their call, who's failed in something, and God is sending you. And guess what? He didn't let you get caught. He didn't let you die. He didn't let you go to jail. He didn't let you stay in the hospital. Why? Because he had something for you to do at that exact moment when someone else will be thrown into their issue. They'll be thrown into their storm. But here you come, just living life, thinking it's just another ordinary day, but God had a plan and purpose and a time for your exact arrival to come by into that person's life at that moment and do what needed to be done to get them to their next spot. And so the sailors played a role in getting Jonah into the sea, but the fish played a role in getting Jonah back to land. And that's what some of us are. We're the fish. We're the one God is using to come by and scoop somebody up and walk with them and pray over them and talk with them and speak into them until they get back to their spot on land where God wants them. Somebody say, I'll be a fish. Say, I'll be a fish. And Jonah gets scooped up by the craziest Uber ever. Here come free willy. Yeah. And swimming through the sea and picks him up. And then Jonah wants to have a prayer meeting. And he begins to pray. And the, who prepared the storm? Who prepared the fish? And then in verse 10, chapter 2, it says, The Lord spoke to the fish. Now, this is going. Mm. Now, now Aquaman is now apparently a part of the Bible. He spoke to the fish and told the fish to vomit Jonah up. <laughs> the Lord speaks to something that has no language. The Lord speaks to something that has no way of communicating back to him. The Lord speaks to something that has no ability to talk. And the thing he speaks to that has no ability to talk, has no language, responds. Church, do you know what that tells me? You're going to get ready to shout. He will speak to what he has to in order to release what he wants to. I'm going to let that sit right there. He will speak to what he has to. I don't care if it knows how to talk back. It has to obey. Because when God speaks to a thing, the thing he speaks to has to release what he wants to release. So when he was creating the earth and when he was creating the world, the Bible says that he spoke to the firmament. And he spoke to the sky and and it had to release rain. He spoke to the earth, and it had to release seed. He speaks to the thing that holds the potential. 
He speaks to the thing that holds what he wants to release and commands it to be released. And the thing he speaks to has to release it. And so when he wants something done in your life, when he wants you to accomplish something, he speaks to the thing that holds the potential. He speaks to the thing that's carrying around what he wants released. I see, so this is why some of you are standing up. Some of you aren't standing up yet because you don't quite get it. Some of you aren't responding because you're not quite getting it. I'm trying to tell you, the Lord wants to speak to you. And when he speaks to you, he created you in a way where you're supposed to respond. And when you respond, there is a release that takes place. So when he tells you, go pay for that person's lunch, it releases generosity into that person's life. When he tells you to go pay for their gas, it releases love into the atmosphere of that person's life when he tells you to call that person because they're just on your mind and you can't figure out why you pick up the phone and call them and even if they don't pick up you leave a voicemail and say the Lord just led me to call you today because I wanted to release some peace over your life I wanted to release some prayer over your life I don't know why but I'm gonna obey God see he speaks to the thing that holds the potential to release it into the earth and so when he needed Jonah released he spoke to the fish and no matter if the fish could talk if the fish could hear or if the fish had any language it was the creation of God and so since it was the creation of God the creation had to respond to the creator and when the creator said to creation release what's in you the fish had to release what's in you that's why some of us are still frustrated because you haven't yet released what's in you you have yet to even discover what all is in you but the lord is wanting you to know today he is speaking you through this word to stand up and begin to release the gift in you begin to step up stop worrying about man's opinion you've got something in you to release stop worrying about what they'll say on social media you got something in you to release Stop worrying about how many followers you might have or not have. You have something in you to release. Somebody shout, I have it in me. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm almost done, I promise. Just about 45 more minutes. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Huh. Watch this. All this just to get one man into the right position. Don't lose sight of that. God is doing all of this just to get one man into the right position. Keep that in your mind. When you look at Jonah again, God does all of this to get one man, one, one, back into the right spot. The fish vomits him up. And we just move on from the story into chapter 3, where it says, watch this, the word of the Lord, chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah what? How many times? How many times? Come on now. There we go. Came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, and preach the message I tell you to. Came to Jonah a second time. Even after Jonah ran from God. God still wanted to use Jonah. Even after Jonah used his own money to go in a whole different direction. And then probably blame the devil for it. I'm not going to let me know park there. They got a little sensitive right there. Um, God still wanted to use Jonah. Even when Jonah came in smelling like Jack Daniels, he still wanted to use Jonah. Even when Jonah had an affair, he still wanted to use Jonah. Even when Jonah was addicted to pornography, 
He still wanted to use Jonah. E even when Jonah was a liar, he still wanted to use Jonah. Even when Jonah uh, cheated on some stuff, he still wanted to use e Even when Jonah didn't show up to church every single week, he still wanted to use Jonah. Even when Jonah was cussing people out in the grocery store parking lot, scratch that, he was cussing people out in the church parking lot, he still wanted to use Jonah. I came to tell somebody, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. That tells me that God still wanted to use Jonah just in the same way he wants to use you even though he tripped even though you fail even though it was a complete disaster and a complete debacle he still wants to use you the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time that tells me there is mercy and there is grace enough for God that God gives to us to, to keep us and carry us until it's time for us to actually do what he called us to do. He still wants to use you. Come out of that condemnation. Come out of that mindset that religion has told you that you'll never be able to do anything great again because of the, the asterisks that are on your record and all the, the bullet points on your record that, that the enemy says, see, here's the record of why you can't do anything great again. Here's why. Here's why. You did this. You did that. And that's the enemy's job is to condemn. The devil is a liar, but yet he tries to condemn the brethren day and night. He stands before God condemning day and night. But I came to tell the devil that there's been some asterisks removed off of my record, and it was done by the blood. There's something called the blood of Jesus that erased all my sin. The blood of Jesus that covered me when I wasn't acting right, when I was saying the wrong things, when I was doing the wrong stuff. It was the blood of Jesus that kept me. Does anybody still believe in the blood of Jesus that covered you and kept you and washed your sins away? Thank God the word came a second time. Thank God the Lord still wanted to use me. I thought I was unusable myself, but the Lord saw something in me that he still could use. I'm going to tell your neighbor, he could still use you. Tell your neighbor, he could still use you. Come on, he could still use you. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. Stay where you're at. Stay where you're at. He wanted to use Jonah to do this specific thing and show Jonah mercy in order to get him to do it. Watch this. Watch this. Listen to me. Here it is. It's God's mercy. God's mercy is what fills the time between your disobedience and obedience. God's mercy is what fills the time and the gap between your disobedience and your obedience. He pushes things aside that you sh should have took you out. Because it's his mercy filling the gap between your disobedience and obedience. Because he's got a fish prepared for you to get you back. And he's got a people that will love you enough to push you. And he's got a place that he wants to send you. For Jonah, it was Nineveh. And he gets into Nineveh, and the Bible says, he goes in day one, y'all. Day one. They didn't have no three-night tent revival. We're talking day one. Walks into the city. Forty days. What does he say? I don't even know what he said. Forty days and what? And Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's what he said. That's all he said. I mean, of course, there's probably more to his message, but that's what we have recorded in Scripture. Forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's verse 4 in chapter 3. That's verse 4. Next verse. So the people believe God. He went on day one. Day one. Forty days. God get ready to judge this place. Next verse. And the people repented. It's almost like Nineveh was waiting for Jonah. It's 
some of us are building up so much insecurity in ourselves. Well, I wonder if I'm, if I, this is for me. I wonder, is it, is it called, am I called to do this? Is this for me? And, and, I'll, and if you'll just put all that noise aside and step up and be the man or woman of God, Amen. that what he put in you to do, and it was day one. He didn't go through some kind of process. It was day one. He did what God said. Next verse, the people responded. The people that were called to hear Jonah's voice. I wonder what Nineveh in your life is lacking because you're still running. Watch this. What impact is missing because you're still on the boat? Thinking that's not for you. And I shouldn't even say it that way because once Jonah preaches and everybody repents, everybody from the city all the way to the king, the king repents. That represents influence. Jonah had kingdom influence in a whole city he'd never been to before. Just by doing what God sent him to do. And he goes out and the Bible says he was angry in chapter 4. He is mad at God. Why are you mad, Jonah? You did what God told you to do. Look at the results. Because Jonah says, this is what I said back, in tar uh, back, back home. I, in other words, I knew if I came and did what you said, you would forgive them. We think Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh. But Nineveh was an Assyrian city who were is enemies of Israel. It's modern day Iraq. I knew you were going to forgive them because you're a merciful, ain't that what it said? You, you're a God who, you, 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 you relent from doing harm. So I knew if I went and did what you said, you wouldn't kill them. That's why I didn't want to go, because I wanted you to. I wanted you to take Nineveh out. Do you know what they did to me? You know what Nineveh's been saying? You know who Nineveh is? They're black. They're white. They're Hispanic. I don't want to go there. And some of us are still dealing with the prejudices in our hearts. That we need to let God deal with. And he is upset with God because God didn't take them out. And ultimately, in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we see is this the source of why Jonah ran in the first place. Because he did not want God to forgive them and show them mercy. And this became the source of his frustration. And the Bible says he went outside the city. Because frustration will lead you to isolation. He removes himself from a city of 120,000 people and goes out to a hillside and is sitting there by himself, just mad. Just, I can't believe this is happening. What do you do when you do what God asks you to do and it don't turn out the way you wanted it to? When God doesn't bring the outcome that you wanted, even though you did what he wanted, Jonah isolates himself. But it says God prepared a plant. What did God prepare? He sent the storm. He prepared a fish. He spoke to the fish. He prepared a plant. The plant gets eaten by the worm God prepared. So not only can God prepare whales, he can prepare worms. You know what that tells me? Watch, catch this spiritual picture here. He can prepare the biggest thing as well as the smallest thing. And some of us think your issue is like a worm issue, that it don't matter to God. Every detail of your life matters to God. Every detail matters to God. And then the worm ate the plant, the plant died, and then what God prepare a vehement east wind, it says. That blew heat all over, and it burdened Jonah so much he was about to faint and wanted to die. I'm done. Worship team, y'all come on. I'm getting ready to close. Can everybody stand to your feet? And God's 
talking to Jonah and Jonah's talking back to God and Jonah's saying, it's better for me to die. I'd rather die. In other words, Lord, if you're going to kill somebody, just kill me. If you ain't going to destroy them, go ahead and destroy me. I'd rather die than see them win. Y'all don't like this preaching. I'd rather end it all. I'd rather be done with my call and my purpose than the one who I think don't deserve it be forgiven. And God said, you mad, bro? You have, what right do you have to be angry at, at the plant? Because the Bible said Jonah was very grateful for the plant, Joe. Do you see that? It said in chapter 4, it says in verse 7, or verse 6, Jonah was very grateful for the plant. So Jonah's grateful for the plant, but he hates the people. As long as he's got the stuff he needs, I could care less about these people. Sounds like a lot of Christians. You can cover it up with religious language, jargon, but at the end of it all, your, your, uh, uh, I guess we'll call it ability, for lack of a better word. And being a Christian is not found in how loud you applaud at church. It's found in how you love your neighbor. That's where, Chris, that's where Jesus was. Now listen to this. It's easy to applaud for something that we never apply. And I don't want us to be a church that gets great at applauding things, but never applying things. Because impact in this city, impact in this region, and impact in this state and nation will not happen if we're just a church that knows how to applaud really well. We got to be a church that knows how to apply, that knows how to forgive, that knows how to walk in joy and happiness, to live a sacrificial life. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He set it before him as a joy. The most painful, excruciating thing that any human being could go through, he set before him as a joy and he endured the cross Jonah's story ends with frustration he ends watch this Jonah's last word to God is death did you catch that he says it is right for me to be angry even to death that's Jonah's last words recorded in scripture last words but it wasn't the last words of that story. Because the last words we read in Jonah are not the words of Jonah. It is the word of the Lord. And we see a merciful, gracious God still trying to win over a son of his. Still trying to come after Jonah. Even after Jonah ran and even after Jonah came back and did what God asked him to do and still was mad and upset and ticked off for what didn't go the way he wanted it to go and it was unfeel, unfulfilled, unmet. Uh, all those things that I read about what frustration is. And God is still ending the story by telling Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh? He's telling Jonah, he's showing us what his heart is like. He is showing us, this is my heart. I call people back to repentance over and over again. I want them to respond. It is not the will of God that any should perish. That's right. That's right. And in the same way, he was calling and trying to explain to Jonah, and Jonah was frustrated. He says to us today, I am a merciful God. 
I know you're frustrated. I know you're walking through some anger. I know you're dealing with some bitterness. I know you're dealing with some resentment. But listen to me. I am still speaking to you. Thank God that when we get up in our feelings and we get hurt and we get frustrated that we don't serve a God who shuts up his mouth. He wants you to know. He wants to talk to you. He wants to release you from frustration. And just because Jonah's story ended in frustration doesn't mean yours has to today. <laughs> Who am I talking to? Frustrated. Be honest. Don't, don't, be, don't come up in here with no mask on. I ain't talking about mask. I'm talking about your, your mask that sometimes we put on when we come to church. Get out of your seat. Come down here. We're going we're gonna to break frustration. Come on, come on. We're going to break frustration. I said we're going to break frustration in this place today. Come on. I mean, we're going to break it. Yeah, scoot up, scoot up. Y'all pull them close. Come on. Thank you, ushers. They're still coming. Just living frustrated. I understand. Frustration will make you quit. Right in the middle of you being on your, on your way to somewhere great. I know, look, it's impossible to see it. It's impossible to see it. Because frustration has a way of clouding things and, and confusing things. And watch this. And, and disorienting you. Listen to me. And frustration has a way of making you run places that you are not for you to run to. Frustra people haven't even hurt in relationships. Watch this. When that happens, you'll be so frustrated, you'll engage in what I call retaliation ships. That means you'll just go into any relationship that you can find to find what looks like peace, but it's not. What looks like comfort. And you'll be more susceptible when you're frustrated to do something that eases the pain. Even if it causes damage to you at some level. And so in frustration, we can get disoriented. But we can be frustrated and still be discerning. You don't have to be disoriented. You can still be discerning. Jesus was frustrated with the temple. Watch this. Jesus was frustrated with the temple, and he went in, and he flipped over tables. Maybe there's some things you need to turn over. Maybe there's some things in your life you need to flip over and turn over. You can become very vulnerable in frustrated places. You're looking for answers. You're looking for, for, for clarity, and you're just trying to grab at stuff. Let me tell you, this is your compass right here. This is it. This is it. The Word of God. I've been chewing on that scripture in 2 Corinthians where it says, I might be hard-pressed, but I'm not destroyed. I might be perplexed, but I'm not in despair. And I go through that scripture in 2 Corinthians and the Holy Spirit showed me something in that, that the results that were meant for me when I was hard pressed are not my results. See, the result of being hard pressed is you get crushed. The result of being perplexed, meaning you don't know why things are happening the way they are. The result of that in the natural should be despair. But in the supernatural, I can be hard pressed and the result that was meant for me not, not touch me. Isn't that powerful? Because you have a God who understands. We have a great high priest who understands everything you are experiencing right now. And I just feel we declared at our prayer rally today that this is an atmosphere of breakthrough. Come on. This is an atmosphere of breakthrough. Y'all play with me. Come on. Play prophetically. Let's start to play some things. And let's break something in this atmosphere. Come on. We're breaking frustration. Y'all lift your hands. Lift your hands. 
We're breaking frustration in the name of Jesus. We break it right now. Maybe there's some decisions that were made that brought about frustration. But Lord, today, we declare we refuse to live in frustration. We know life has frustration, that people frustrate us, situations frustrate us, the job frustrates us, but Lord, we do not have to live in frustration for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And so when the frustration tries to pull us down into that deep, dark pit of anger and resentment and, and, and worry and anxiousness, we will rejoice and we shall declare the word of the Lord over our life that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Come on, somebody begin to declare joy. Somebody say, I got joy. Romans 15 and 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. James 1 and 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures of forevermore. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. John 16.24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I dare somebody in this altar and in this room begin to take Jesus at his word and begin to ask that your joy may be full. Come on, let your joy be full today. Come on, let your joy be full today. Come on, we break depression in the name of Jesus. We speak joy. Come on, we declare joy in the atmosphere. Lord, release joy in this place. Lord, break everything that's trying to keep people bound in the the anxiety bound in the anger. Lord, release today. Lord, put them back in the direction they need to go. Let them step back on the dry land. Let them step back on the dry ground, sturdy ground. Lord, let them not look back, but let them look forward to the hope that is found in you. Lord God, right now I declare, Lord, peace to minds that are tormented by frustration. Lord, language that comes out of people's mouths that causes them to speak curses and not blessing. Lord, we declare we shall speak blessing and not cursing. We shall speak joy and not frustration. We shall speak by faith. No matter what we see, we shall speak by faith. We shall live by faith. We shall walk by faith. In the name of Jesus, come on. Somebody worship in this place. Come on, lift your voice and worship. Come on. Everybody in this altar, look at me. Look at me. 
final scripture, I want you to take this with you. You ready? Proverbs 17 and 22. Come on, this is it. A joyful heart is good medicine. It's good medicine. Be constant in prayer. Offer up your prayers to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your heart and your mind. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. It literally affects you physically. Start choosing joy. Stop waiting for somebody to bring you joy. Stop waiting for someone else to put your joy on their job description. My joy is not your responsibility. It's my responsibility. I did. Watch this. You start getting frustrated, start praying, and start begin to thank God for everything you do have in your life. I try it. Try it. I did it the other day. I was trying. I was about to go down one of them little rabbit holes. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, you know, you know, there was some words. There were some words. But the moment I began to say, God, I thank you for my beautiful wife. I thank you for my healthy children. I thank you for a great church. I thank you that I got my health. I thank you I can go to the gym. I thank you that I have an automobile. I thank, and see, you'll just keep going. And before you know it, 30 minutes will pass, and you'll be still thanking God for everything you got in your life. And all of a sudden, that frustration that used to rest on you has got to go. It's got to go because joy and disgruntlement and depression cannot live in the same place. We really appreciate you watching. Why don't you go ahead and click that share button and share it with a friend so they can enjoy it as well. If you want to find out more information about Hope Church, follow us on social media or go to our website. At our website, you can find out how to get involved when our next baptisms are, and how you can give and support this ministry financially. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.